Hello, everyone. I'm Dana Perino, along with Judge Janine Pirro, Harold Ford Jr., Charlie Hurd, and Greg Gutfeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York City. This is The Five. Isn't that funny? Donald Trump and Elon Musk holding a wide-ranging two-hour talk on X. That's the platform formerly known as Twitter. At times, the two titans were chatting like old friends and touching on everything from the economy, education, AI, and Kamala Harris. The thing that they really is making them angry is what Kamala and Biden have allowed to happen to the economy. It's a disaster with inflation. She's yeah. incompetent and he's incompetent. And frankly, I think that she's more incompetent than he is. And that's saying something, because he's not too good. She's a radical left lunatic. And if she's going to be our president, very quickly, you're not going to have a country anymore. And she'll go back to all yeah. of the things that she believes in. She believes in defunding the police. She believes in no fracking. They're rewriting history and, um, and making uh, Kamala sound like a moderate, when in fact she is far left, like far, far left. So the interview was also chock full of some serious uh, Trumpian moments. Watch this. The stupid threats coming from a stupid face. Illegal immigration <laughs> saved my life. You're right, but it, was, <laughs> it had to be at that exact <laughs> angle. I said to Vladimir Putin, I say, don't do it. You can't do it, Vladimir. You do it. It's going to be a bad day. You cannot do it. And I told him things that what I do, and he said, no way. And I said, way. I saw a picture of her yeah, yeah. on Time magazine today. She looks like the most beautiful actress ever to live. I, it was a drawing. And uh, actually, yeah, yeah. she looked very much like our great first lady, Melania. As if something happens with this election, which would be a horror show, we'll meet the next time in Venezuela because it'll be a far safer place to meet than our country. There are some in the media. You can imagine they're not happy that you got to hear those words. Hours before the interview even began, there was one reporter from The Washington Post that asked if the White House was going to intervene to prevent misinformation. I think that um, misinformation on Twitter is not just a campaign issue. It's a, you know, it's an America issue. Uh, what role does the White House uh, or the president have in sort of stopping that or stopping the spread of that or um, sort of inter intervening. In Charlie, I was just thinking back to our days in the briefing room, and if somebody would have asked that, you, I know you would have laughed out they, loud. They, yeah, they would have been drummed out of there as they should have been, and I don't, I, I really don't get it. But it does, it does underscore just how far I think far uh, the the uh, you know journalistic standards have fallen over the years, uh, but also how zealously everybody, uh, there's so many people in the left wing press are working overtime to sort of extend this honeymoon as long as they can. I don't think that they can do it until the election, which is the real problem, although I do think that uh, she's going to probably get another week of it, uh, of, the, of the honeymoon, uh, mm -hmm. because of the, of the uh, convention next week in Chicago. But, I, you know, I thought that that thing last night was absolutely fascinating. You have two of the most consequential people on the planet today talking about uh, real things, um, talking about rockets and tunnels, and, uh, and of course, you know, Donald Trump used to drive his people crazy when, when he ran in 2016, talking about how he builds buildings. I build buildings. People who do that are problem solvers. And if you listen to the whole, that entire uh, thing last night, they were talking about solving problems. And you're not talking about ideologues or politicians. They're people who want to solve problems. And it's very refreshing whether it breaks through and actually changes anybody's mind, I don't know. But it is, I do think it's sort of the right direction if you want to solve the problems that are facing our country. And we have plenty of them. Can you guys play for us the soundbite from Elon Musk about how, how he considers himself? I've not been very political before. They try to paint me as like a far right guy, which is absurd because I'm like making electric vehicles. I supported Obama. I stood in line for six hours to shake Obama's hand. Historically, a moderate Demo Democrat. And, and But now I feel like we're really at, at a critical juncture for the country. So people out there who are in the moderate camp to say, I think you should support um, Donald Trump for president. I thought that was an interesting 
take it. What do you think? Well, piggybacking on Charlie Hurt's point, uh, they weren't talking about amorphous, dystopian hypotheticals. They were actually talking about economic development. They were talking about debt, energy, artificial intelligence. And you're <laughs> watching two people, arguably the two of the most powerful people on the planet, agreeing about the state of the world and also talking about the future, not making up stories of the past like the fine people hoax, which is what uh, Harris and Liz Warren were pushing last night. When you look, you know, when you look at when you look at this, think about those um, televised hearings when our politicians uh, are talking about one issue and they have to be prepped by staffers bearing reams of research laid out perfectly for them, and they still don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> and yet these two guys, you know, I don't know how deep uh, Trump can go on this stuff, but he can at least talk about artificial intelligence. Kamala Harris is the is the czar of AI, and the only thing she knows about AI is that she could use some. And then her campaign, her campaign, which kills me, said that it was two rich guys talking. So I guess like Apollo Apollo 11 was a bunch of white guys going on a road trip. It's, it kind of celebrates, uh, it's it's a defense of lethargy and ignorance. You know, the, on one hand, you got a man who created an implant to help paralyzed people think. He builds rockets and cars. On the other hand, you got a guy who doesn't even get paid to be president. He could have retired, mm -hmm. and he gets shot. But these are two rich guys talking. There's like this weird decline in the appreciation of achievement. These are people that we used to, when I was growing up, you'd put them up on a pedestal and say, I want to be Howard Hughes. You know, or I want to be Joe DiMaggio. In this case, they don't like aspirational efforts unless the government can take credit for it. They mock private citizens when they do well because, you know, it's just two guys talking. And mm. it's like two rich guys talking, you know, and, and Waltz. You know what? Walt, Waltz doesn't have anything. He doesn't have a bank account. Isn't that amazing? No, it's not. It's kind of sad. I want. I, I just want to touch on the 30-minute the delay thing and watching people dunk on that. Um, when you're an inventor who aims for big things, every day you have a failure to launch, whether it's a rocket, whether it's a business, whether it's some social media experiment. That is successful people fail every single day and they fail big. The only people who don't understand that are actual failures. People who aren't successful don't understand how failure is necessary to succeed. Compare Musk's failure last night to Harris failing spectacularly in the 2019 primary. She failed horribly and still got a VP slot. And then in 2024, they wanted her off the ticket and she, be, she ended up on the ticket. So that doesn't happen in the private sector. You own your failures. You know, in the public sector, they just boost you on up. I was thinking when you mentioned the judge, the two rich guys having a conversation. What if it had been Donald Trump and Warren Buffett? Mm -hmm. Would that have been a complaint? Because Warren Buffett is very supportive of Kamala Harris. It's like if you're rich on one end, then you're good. But if not, if you support Trump, then you're not good. Uh, you know, but the, the point that Greg makes is a good one. I mean, these are guys who have reached the pinnacle in the business world. And they're just the two of them having a free-flowing conversation that Kamala is trying to convince us, or the Democrats are trying to convince us, is really a threat to democracy. It's a threat to democracy because they can't control the narrative. And the amazing part of it is that Musk said, look, if Kamala Harris wants to come on X and have this yeah. conversation, I'd be happy to have her on as well. So, um, I, you know, I kind of like listening to some substance as opposed to talking for weeks on end about how Kamala just won't come out and speak. Although what she did do was it, she says that uh, uh, apparently last night she says they're trying to control democracy and so she started fundraising. Chip in $25 now so we can respond to their lies. It'd be real easy. Respond to their lies by, you know, sitting down and having an interview, maybe even with Elon Musk. But, you know, I liked hearing about an Iron Dome for the United States. I liked hearing about different things that could be helpful to us. Some substantive things and not the same stuff, you know, that, that we've been talking about. And I, I really admire the two of them for what they were willing to say and what they were unafraid of. And, you know, people are on Donald Trump all the time about the leaders of North Korea and Russia and China. 
he just talks about them being at the top of their game. He isn't praising them. He's speaking about reality. And, you know, by, when Biden is there, Putin invades Ukraine. Iran launches, you know, uh, Hamas goes against Israel. And, you know, he really is just recognizing the reality of the world. So um, I think that a lot of this and what the American people have to understand is it is during the Biden administration and the Kamala Biden-Harris that they censored information, they called us extremists, you know, that they, they, they want to take us back, uh, as opposed to the free-flowing information of democracy. How did you see it, Harold? I listened to parts of it. Good to be with you, Charlie. Good to see you. It's, it's, uh, I listened to, I saw me? you yesterday, and I, I love no, both of you. I love, <laughs> and I, and I love the judge. Wow. I, I'd, say, I'd say a couple things. Um, I listened about half of it. Um, I don't care if they're poor guys or rich guys or middle class guys. Uh, they're two guys who have been very successful. It's interesting. In July of 2022, both of these guys said negative things about one another publicly. Uh, Mr. Musk said something on Twitter saying that Donald Trump was too old to serve out another term and that he thought DeSantis would run running away. And I think Mr. Trump said that said some things about Mr. Musk as well. I'm glad to see that uh, we all can agree that it, they can move beyond those things. Two, Kamala Harris has her vulnerabilities, there's no doubt. She's trying her hardest to tack to the center on a number of issues. Uh, it will be interesting to see during this debate. Uh, it appears that on Friday she's going to give a speech in North Carolina about her economic policies uh, and about what differences or things that she aligns with President Biden on. I do find it interesting that we, some people call her uh, incompetent and they don't think that she can rise up to the ability but then they assign all of the blame for everything that's happened bad in the economy. She's either smart or dumb. Uh, I happen to think she, she's smart. And we're going to get a chance to see on Friday whether or not she has real ideas and substantive ideas or the beginning of that uh, to, 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 to move the country to a different place economically. Uh, I'll see, tell another thing about, I think, this coming Friday, and even as we get closer to the convention, President Trump had 28 and a half million people watch him. Uh, in his convention speech. I thought the first 25 minutes of that speech, Charlie and I were together, Dane and I were together uh, that, that evening, um, uh, was brilliant. I thought the remaining 60 or 70 could have been, could have been probably organized a little bit better. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see if Vice President Harris, if she's able to, after this Friday's presentation, maintain the interest in her over the next week to see if she can get a big viewership as well. Uh, I hope she's able to. I think, uh, I think it's uh, good for the country. Democrats shouldn't be confused, though. This race is extremely tight. Uh, it will remain tight for a while as we look at these states that, that where the, 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 the swing voters are. Uh, and Kamala Harris is going to have to be on her A game, and so is, so is President Trump. I will say the one take, other takeaway I had from the, the other night or last night, I thought there were things they talked about substance, but I, you know, it reminded me that Biden's frailties um, kind of mask some of Trump's um, uh, challenges going into this race. And now that President Trump is trying his hardest to find a way to go to, to challenge and to go up against Vice President Harris, you heard, you heard sounds of it, Judge. I would agree with you. Some of those ideas were interesting. Some I even, I even agreed with. Then you heard parts of it that were not, there was a little pessimism. I don't think you praise China's leader and Russia's leader. There's nothing wrong with saying we have to beat them, but I think praising those leaders, that's just not, to, to your point, well, he Greg. He wasn't I'm, praising them. That's what I was saying. Well, put it this he way. The way but the, I've never heard, uh, Greg made the point that there was a time we elevated these leaders, but there were leaders I remember watching as a kid, um, uh, President Reagan, uh, Mr. Chrysler, jo John Johnson, who ran Johnson. Puff. They would never elevate leaders that way. They would talk about the challenges and how we would overcome those. At least those, that's how I grew up. Um, and I agree with you in that, in that regard. But look, we've got a big race in front of us, and I'm looking forward to every debate and every exchange between these two candidates. Do you think we get to sit next to each other at the convention next week, Harold? I can't wait. We can write notes back and forth. I can't wait. Ooh. Who are we seeing with us oh. next week? I have a picture I mean, with you on my phone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he shows it to everyone. Yeah. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You won't get it anywhere else.